Hey everyone. I think in there is it. It should be on to facilitate. If not, I will. I can do the end time. Is it me or is Google Docs down again? Not just you, it's having some trouble. <laughs> I feel like it's just like whenever we have a meeting, it goes down for five minutes. They know it's us, <laughs> it's on purpose. <laughs> oh boy. Hello everyone, good morning. Good evening. Good morning. The moderator is late to the party, sorry about that. <laughs> Don't worry, Google Docs was waiting for you. <laughs> so um, as is customary, we'll just give it another minute and we'll get started here. We've got a very interesting presentation on tap. So while we're waiting, I'd love uh, to maybe ask for some contributors to be scribes for today. I can be the scribe. Right? Awesome. Thanks, Arna. No worries. I'm happy to do it as well. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. All right, uh, let's get uh, started with, um, with our uh, housekeeping items. Uh, I'm going to go through, and first thing is, uh, I see a lot of members on the call today, but if you haven't already added your names, please do so. And if you'd like to uh, bring up any items that you'd like to talk about, uh, please make sure to include that next to your name so we can uh, make sure we discuss that. Uh, So as I go through, I don't see any updates from the group at this time. With that, I'll just also quickly make sure uh, is Doug on the, uh, Doug's on the call. Awesome. Hey, uh, Doug. Hello. So we give it another minute maybe and then get started. All right, I don't see any updates uh, from the group uh, today. So uh, in that case, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce uh, Doug Davis from IBM. Uh, he's also been uh, you know, leading the charge on all things serverless with the CNCF. Uh, he leads the serverless working group and has been uh, you know, working very, very hard. And I was uh, privy to a lot of the early discussions with the, the cloud events uh, work that's being done. Uh, I don't wanna take uh, Doug's thunder, but uh, Doug, very happy to have you here uh, present to us about uh, the status of the serverless working group. And you know, as we start off today, I just thought maybe I'll just give provide one particular input. I think there's been a lot of debate on what exactly serverless is and what constitutes serverless. So it would be great if you could also uh, you know sound out on that and give your perspective as to what exactly is serverless. I have my thoughts. With that, uh, please take it away, Doug, and thank you for being here today. 
Carol, yeah, thanks for having me. So when, when Sarah approached me to talk to you guys, um, she gave me some guidance in terms of what you wanted me to talk about, but not a whole lot. So I wasn't sure what to, to put together in terms of preparation for this. So please do not hesitate to stop me and ask me to, some questions or to go in a different direction because I was guessing in terms of what to put together in this presentation, okay? So just don't hesitate to, to send us on down a different track if that's, if that's the way you guys wanna go. Okay, so one of the things she's mentioned is something you were just asking about, you know, what is serverless? And I think from the serverless working group's perspective, the best way to think of it is to first start out with what is a function? And typically those are uh, operations that are, or they're, they're processes, you know, like uh, workloads or applications, what do you want to call it? You know, something that's sitting there wait, wait, waiting to do work. They're typically event-driven. Each request is typically short duration, typically stateless. And with the goal of hopefully it being lower cost because you're breaking up the monolith into either uh, even smaller pieces than just uh, what microservices, right? These are supposed to be tiny little bits of things to get your job done. More like, <clears throat> I tend to look at it as like a whole bunch of like little utility classes or functions, right? They, they're there to do one particular task and then stop and something else possibly bigger from an orchestration point of view is looking at the overall flow. Um, and so when you think of it in that way, obviously then a function is something relatively small like this little sample here. And what's interesting is um, for most people, a function doesn't even deal with the HTTP or transport aspects of things, right? So if you look at this little, this little sample right here, this thing talks about you know, how to take in parameters, how to process the parameters and then return something. It doesn't deal with the HTTP or, or transport aspect of things. That's supposed to be sort of managed by the infrastructure that's hosting your function. Now, that's the way most people tend to look at it. However, there are some environments, take for example, Knative, where the user is responsible for managing the HTTP aspect of things, right? So they have to inject an HTTP server into their little JavaScript code here um, just to get things up and running or let the JavaScript framework to a form, but either way, they have to sort of set that up themselves. Now that's not true for everything like Lambda will do it for you, but for there, I just wanna make it clear that there are some environments where you have to do that yourself manually, but that doesn't change what a function is and from this perspective of it being a small little utility class to get one particular task done and that's about it, okay? Um, so obviously when you look at this from a, uh, an event-driven process thing, right? You have your, your function executing someplace you're gonna have an event producer or event source generating events that gets sent over to your function to do some work. And as I said, typically these functions are meant to be stateless. So they have to talk to some backend service often to store the persistence or to get access to a database or something like that, right? But what that allows is for these functions to not only just be stateless, but then to be also scalable, right? That way they can come and go as they need to based upon the workload, but all the real data is stored back here in the backend. So that, that allows them to be, to be stateless. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, hopefully none of this is actually new. So <clears throat> what is serverless then relative to functions? Well, the way I tend to look at it is serverless takes function to service one step further. Okay, because function by itself, as I said, if it's just a small little unit of work, notice what I didn't talk about, something that is very popular with serverless environments, things like auto scaling of the function based on, on demand, even down to zero, right? So to me, the difference between functions and serverless is that serverless adds a bit more of the orchestration and management layer around it, right? Function is just small little micro microservice. Serverless says, okay, now let's do auto scaling based upon load or CPU or some other metric, including to scale down to zero because one of the popular aspects of serverless, well, it's not that's true for all of them, it is very popular, is that when it's not being used, it scales down to zero so that if you're in an environment where there's a cost associated with it, it's gonna be zero cost when it's not being executed, okay? So overall, you can think of serverless as not needing to worry about the managing the infrastructure, but then serverless is meant to actually invoke functions under the covers. Now, I, sh I will point out though that there are a lot of people who use the term serverless outside of functions in the sense that they don't think of what they're hosting as a function. So for example, uh, if you look at something like Cloud Foundry, no one's gonna say that's a function as a service environment. Those are typically web apps, maybe microservices, but they also could be rather large things. Now, one thing that, that Cloud Foundry is missing is the scale down to zero part, but it will do auto scaling up from one, right? But if, so if you could add the scale to zero 
to me, uh, Cloud Foundry could be a serverless environment from that definition of it's just there to manage the infrastructure for you. You give it the source code, you give it your deployment artifact, whatever it is, and it manages the rest for you, okay? That's to me what serverless is all about. It's just the most popular use of it is for functions, okay? So <clears throat> with all that in as a background, let's talk about the serverless working group. So the serverless working group in the CNCF was started, I think around June, 2017, mainly because the TOC wanted to understand what to do with serverless, if anything at all. At that point in time, serverless was still a relatively new thing from a community perspective. Obviously things like Lambda had been out there for a while, but it really hadn't taken off in terms of a broad open source community kind of a thing. And so they wanted to know, okay, what do we do with it? And in order to make that kind of recommendation or analysis, we first had to do what I would call sort of background work, right? Figure out what is serverless and it's kind of, you know, what I just, what I just talked about in the first four slides, right? What is serverless? What's the state of the technology, the state of the ecosystem and stuff like that? You know, what is out there today, both from an open source perspective, as well as a proprietary perspective. And so we, we basically did that. We came up with a white paper explaining all this in, in wonderful gory details, along with a set of recommendations in terms of what to do next. And I'll get to that in a second. But the other thing we created was a landscape. And I, if you go to the serverless working group um, pages or get a repo, you will find a link to, I think it's a Google spreadsheet that tries to list out all the popular uh, serverless frameworks out there, what each one does, the languages they support, what kind of backend services they have, stuff like that. It, it's not necessarily the completely up to date, but at least it gives you an idea of sort of the a general shape of what the community has out there today. Okay. Now, in terms of recommendations, we did come up with some interesting things. And I remember correctly, a lot of them were things like uh, look for other or, or look for serverless frameworks in the open source community that we can encourage to join the CNCF to start building up an ecosystem within the CNCF around serverless. Also trying to look for education opportunities and explaining what is serverless, why it's so great and stuff like that. But one of the biggest things is we want to look at where we could help out the community relative to adoption or interoperability. <clears throat> because while there were some, or while there were and still are a whole bunch of different serverless frameworks out there, there really wasn't much of interoperability between them. Um, so, so for example, there are some uh, that run on Kubernetes and that's great. They all run on Kubernetes, but the way you interact with them was, was completely different, right? They each had their own set of APIs and stuff like that. So was there some sort of interoperability project we can come up with just to make life easier within the serverless domain? Now, one of the things we realized though is because we had lots of different ideas of things we'd like to be able to do because we're all developers and we love interoperability and standards and all that other stuff, but we realized it, it's gonna get really, really political. Right, because there are existing things out there, and asking anybody to change their their implementations or their APIs is is just asking for trouble. Okay, so what we did is we identified something that's sort of off to the side, and we realized when you think about functions and serverless, as I said, a lot of them are event driven. So we said, okay, well, is there something we can do in the event space? And we realized that one of the pain points that people experience with events is not so much processing of the events, but routing of the events. Meaning, how does an event get from the producer to the consumer? Now today, the way that usually works is, especially if it's going through a piece of middleware, is that middleware has to understand the event coming through it in some way. Even at a meta level, just to understand how to send it to the next destination, it has to know what the destination is, so maybe it has to read some HTTP header or something like that, or whatever even at that level, it has to look at the message in some way. However, most of those intermediaries need to do more than just simplistic proxying type stuff. A lot of them actually want to do routing based upon the event itself. So for example, maybe it wants to do routing based upon where the event is coming from. Maybe it wants to do routing based upon the type of the event, right? Maybe creates go to one destination while deletes go to a different destination, that kind of stuff, okay? Well, in order to make that kind of determination, that middleware has to now understand the event flowing through it. And I don't mean necessarily has to understand all the business logic, but at least has to understand things like how to parse it to know what field to look at to do that routing, okay? So we decided, well, what if we try to help in this space? And that's how we came up with cloud events, 
Okay, and what cloud events is meant to do is to help in the routing from, from the source to the destination by defining common metadata attributes. And I'll, I'll give you an example in a minute. Um, well, actually, let me go ahead and jump there right now. It's easier to talk about that. Okay, so let me look at, let me show you this example right here. So if you look at this, this HTTP post and you ignore these four attributes, the rest of it is just what you might see from an event flowing through or flowing over HTTP, right? You have the, um, in essence, so basically the URL is being sent to, um, yeah, along with the host name, the type of the data, and then the data itself. Okay, now in order for some sort of piece of middleware to route this message appropriately based upon the fact that it knows it's a new item type of action or event, it would have to understand that this is JSON, how to parse this, to look for a field called action, and then take some, some behavior based upon that value, okay? Well, what Cloud Events does, it says, well, wait a minute, what if you just add a couple of extra HTTP headers to this message? Ignore this for a minute, because that just tells you what Cloud Events spec version we're talking about. And this is just a unique ID for the event. Every event has its own unique ID. But these two bits of information tell you where the event came from and the type of the event. So this is a new item, okay? So what this allows a piece of middleware to do is to, without understanding the, the event whatsoever, it can look at this metadata and make some very basic determination in terms of what it wants to do with it relative to routing, okay? This isn't rocket science. You may even look at that and say, oh my gosh, what, what the heck can you do with that? It's so simplistic. And to some extent, that is true. It's not sexy, it's not glamorous, but believe it or not, this actually solves a significant pain point for many people, right? This little bit of extra metadata being outside of the event itself, whoops, actually has been uh, a real lifesaver to a whole bunch of people. I've had many customers come up to me and say, thank you for creating this because we did exactly what I just mentioned. We had to create middleware and every single time there was a new event with a new schema, all the middleware had a change to understand how to parse it and know what to do with it. This makes the life so much easier, okay? And to be honest, if there are other properties that people don't, or don't see today that they wanna to add to it, they can extend this themselves. But the point is, much like HTTP headers in general, we're providing a well-defined location for where this extra bit of metadata is supposed to live so that you can use it for whatever purpose you want much in the same way an HTTP server itself doesn't understand what's in the body most of the time, it routes it to the proper web app based upon an HTTP header, okay? Same concept. Now, that's what we call the binary format. The structured is, is the exact same thing, except people come, came to us and said, you know, this is all great, but what if I don't even have an event that's currently being sent? I'm creating something brand new. Can you guys give us an event wrapper that we can just use? And, we, and so we did, and that's what we call the structured side of things, right? So basically we just said, okay, let's create it in JSON. And you can see it's the exact same data, except instead of HTTP headers, it's inside the body and the data is the exact same. So this serves two purposes. One, give somebody a well-defined wrapper if they don't already have one, because we do not want to create yet another common event format. That was not our purpose. But if they don't have one and they want one recommended, we'll give it to them. But then there are also other cases where people say, you know, this is great, but I don't want the data HTTP headers. I want it in the body because I want to just to be able to take this entire chunk of JSON, stick it into a database, and then let the next step in the process deal with it. And if it's in, if that information is as HTTP headers, then I need to extract HTTP headers and create some sort of global wrapper myself to have all the information there. So it serves multiple purposes to have the structured side of things. And that's what we did. Okay. So anyway, that's what the serverless working group decided to work on first was to attack that particular problem. Okay. Now, while we were working on that, um, we did think about other possible things in terms of next steps to work on. And one of the things that came up was serverless workflow. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that, but you can kind of imagine what it is, right? It's orchestration of functions, right? So events coming into the system, you react to those events, you do some processing, and maybe it's a multi-step process and each step can only process or can only get kicked off uh, after a previous step is already done, who's going to manage that orchestration? Who's going to realize or take manage that one event needs to get sent to five different processes, and then they come back together at the end, kind of a fan and fan out kind of thing? That's what serverless workflow is supposed to do for you, and that's a, it's, that itself is a sandbox project in the CNCF today. Okay, I should have pointed out that the cloud events is now an incubator project. I can't remember when that happened. I think it was about a year or so ago. Um, so that that's in the CNCF as well. 
Um, and just to sort of summarize the status of, this, of cloud events, uh, we did ship 1.0 of the spec in 2019. We have, at, at one point in time, we've had pretty much, I think, every major vendor out there in, in, uh, cloud, in the cloud native world show up at our meeting at one point or another, even AWS, which I think is a big win for us because AWS, while they do do a little bit of open source stuff, they don't do a whole lot, right? So they were there for a while. In all honesty, though, they've, they've, they've sort of backed away, not, I think, because of anything's changed in AWS other than the person who was there left AWS. And so we need to go back and ping them and see if they want to rejoin with a different person. But they are definitely supportive of the idea of cloud events. I just don't think they've adopted it yet because they, they have their own way of doing things as of right now. But they did admit that if we came up with the cloud events several years earlier, they probably would have adopted that instead of doing their own thing. So anyway, we have several different SDKs in several different languages to help you with the creation and processing of cloud events from the sender and consumer side. But the most, the most interesting thing from the latest status perspective is if you think about cloud events, it's great for helping you get the, um, the event from point A to point B. Um, but there's lots of other things involved with just managing the event life cycle itself. In particular, how do you discover who, sets, who sends a particular type of event or what type of events they actually do send so you know what does you want to subscribe to, okay? We decided we're going to start looking at a discovery API spec so that a consumer can go to one or multiple discovery endpoints and find out who generates what, okay? Obviously, once you figure out who generates the thing you're interested in, you may want to then subscribe to it. So we're going to create a subscription API spec that will try to standardize at least for the protocols that don't already have a standardized way, like for example, HTTP, how do you actually do a subscription, right? How do you tell it what events you want, what filters you want, where to send the event, stuff like that. Now, there are many eventing protocols that already have this defined and it is not our goal to reinvent the wheel. For those, go use what's already defined. But for things like HTTP, for webhooks and stuff like that, every producer has their own way of doing it. So we're trying to see if we can get some interoperability around that. And finally, we're also looking at a schema registry. Um, this was created because one of the properties inside cloud events is a pointer to the schema of the event itself. It's an optional attribute people can include if they really want to, but what's missing is the definition of how to talk to schema registries, right? Because normally when, you get, when you're given uh, the URL to a schema, your natural inclination is to say, okay, how do I do it? You know, I'm gonna do an HTTP get to that URL and you'll get the information back in some format. But there really isn't a standard way of actually talking or managing schema in a schema registry itself. So you can get some interoperability, not just on the reading side, but on the creation or update side. And that's what the schema registry is looking to do. Okay. In terms of priorities, I would say probably discovery and subscription are coming first and schema registry last, just because I think more interest lies in these two as of today. And that's pretty much all I had. I would say I have some links here if you guys are interested and can follow those and get more information. But let me go ahead and stop there and see if you have any questions or different areas you want me to sort of zoom in on. Doug, I want to give you a compliment and give the cloud events, like, the, and by the way, it's a great presentation. Um, something with, with Falco, for instance, with the cloud events, the, the, the group that the, one of the contributors, Scott Nichols, came in and, and really explained it and, and the way that it could be used. It's super, super used for, useful for eventing and like you can trigger things. Like he built a cloud events integration for Falco Sidekick that will trigger like based on a rules violation mm -hmm. to multi, multi cloud. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really cool. Definitely, you know, you all should check it out. It's a very good common place to, you know, for the eventing and scheduling, but like serverless itself, in terms of Knative and the working group is doing such a fantastic job. So kudos to you and the team. Yeah, well, I'm glad Scott was able to, to talk to you guys. He's, he's a good guy. So I'm glad that that worked out. Cool. Any other questions? I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Doug. So you talked about, uh, you know, you made the distinction between uh, functions and then serverless, right? And mm -hmm. maybe once again, I've fallen prey to that distinction uh, if there is uh, one there. Yeah. But you know, what are the examples of FAS without the context of serverless, right? Because, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, uh, AWS Lambda or Azure Functions or, I don't know, Cloud Run, you know, they, they, you, you, what are the, I mean, it, it seems like 
you can't have one without the other for any kind of a realistic application. Uh, is that a fair assessment or incorrect? Well, I, I, mm, that's hard to, I, okay, let me, I'm gonna have to ramble a little here because I think it depends on your perspective, right? To some people, functions and serverless are the exact same thing. There's, there's no difference between them whatsoever. And a lot of people use the terms interchangeably. I think if you try to step back and look at it from a purely abstract or puristic perspective, I, I think that's what I tried to lay out here on this chart, which is technically a function, I think to a lot of people, if you, if you actually try to draw a separation, a function is just a smaller microservice, right? That's really all it is. And so if, you, if all you have is a small microservice, well, that could be something that never scales, but it's still a function, right? It's only when you add in, at least to me, some of the management around it, the auto scaling, the scale to zero, zero cost when it's not running. That to me is what's make it serverless because it's about not managing the infrastructure or anything else that goes around it. Because, so, so go back for a minute to the function side, right? I can have a function, but still be forced to manage the entire bit of infrastructure myself. So I can do functions on Kubernetes today and that works just fine. And I could, I could in all, in all honesty and, and all purity say, yes, that is a function, but I still manage all the infrastructure myself and Kubernetes is not easy to use for a novice, right? So no one in the right mind would say Kubernetes is serverless, but does it support functions? Sure, it's just an application, it's just a pod. So right? actually that might also be helpful for this group, I think is, uh, and maybe it's a good tea up for Aradna uh, to talk about the serverless work is, but when you talk about a function in the context of Kubernetes, but you still have something that it needs to run in and the context is a container. So you're, 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 you, you, you are, how do you say, abstracting away the delivery transport? Is that fair? Is that the word to use? Because you still have a function. I mean, function is always a function, but it has to uh, run in some context. And in the context of Kubernetes, it's a container. But in the context of uh, lambdas, it is whatever lambda is. I mean, however they actually facilitate it, maybe containers in the back end. So is, is that the right way of looking at it? So you are not, you don't think about the, the running environment, but when you talk about functions. I, for me personally, Sorry, I, I, I didn't take it up, but we can no, always- No, 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 the reason I'm struggling is because I, I, I think the answer depends on your perspective. I think, I think some people would agree with you that even in a function environment, you should probably, you should not have to think about the hosting side of it, right? For me personally, I, I'm not sure I would agree, right? I, I, I would still say it is perfectly legal for someone to claim that they are a FAS, but still require you to understand the infrastructure in some way. I could be wrong, right? It's just my perspective, but I think, I think it depends on how you're looking at it. Because I think if you're gonna claim that a function is going to hide the, the infrastructure from you, then I think you're probably in the mindset that says functions and serverless are almost one and the same. And I think it's a valid way to approach it. I just have been beat over the head so much with the abstract and, and puristic model that I, I tend to separate the two, even though I'm perfectly comfortable also interchanging the words depending on my audience, right? So yeah, I think it. it depends uh, on your on that. Yeah, fair, I mean, uh, I mean how do you say purity versus practical maybe, thank you. Yeah, yeah, maybe. It, it, just on that, extending that point, would it be fair to say that the serverless, or oh, sorry, the functions are somewhat more of a stateless, but the serverless is more of a stateful? Is it, mm. is it meaningful to say that? No, I think, I think most people would agree that serverless is meant to be stateless as well. Now, you, you could do some stateful things inside your serverless stuff, but the minute you start talking about things auto scaling, especially scaling down to zero, you almost have to assume that they're stateless at the end of the day. Now that doesn't mean they couldn't persist something because you're gonna reuse the container. So therefore you don't wanna to have to reload the cache every time and stuff like that. But I think in the most puristic form, I think serverless is supposed to be stateless as well. Right, without the user's context, I agree with that, but I think once you inject the user and are taking the serverless as a um, substitute for servers, wouldn't you say that you have to preserve some states in that context of that function that you are going through? 
Well, when, when you as say opposed to just the functions itself, because the functions itself, you probably don't need to have any. Well, so there's, there's two I'm, different ways. Am I wrong in that? Well, there's two different ways I kind of perceive your question. One is you're, you're making a distinction between functions and serverless relative to the code itself inside the application. <clears throat> and I'm not sure you should make it, you should draw a distinction there, right? So if something's going to be stateless in functions, that same bit of code is probably going to be stateless and serverless and vice versa, right? So I don't think the difference between FAS versus serverless changes the deployment artifact itself, okay? Now, relative to state though, I, th I th my mind is still stuck in this mode of Yes, you may need to persist things between invocation of either your function or your serverless function, but that's not typically saved inside the, the, the running uh, artifact itself. Those are typically saved in some remote system, some sort of database, or even just a disk that's on a shared volume or something like that, right? Because you wanna be able to scale down and still persist that information. And more importantly, you also wanna be able to scale up so that multiple instances can share that data, right? So I, I really think that the, 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 the FAS versus serverless aspect, I don't think plays into the stateful versus stateless thing. I think that's a separate side discussion. Okay, I, I, I see your point. I think you're saying for the scaling purpose, you have to separate the states yeah. from the Yeah, and like I said though, that doesn't mean you can't do, yeah. and like I said, I don't think that doesn't mean you can't do optimizations, right? So, so for example, there are some environments where they scale or the function when it's not being used scales down within milliseconds. Persistent and that, you know, that, that, that's valid, um, but some sort of persistence store there inside the container doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But if your runtime environment or your, your container um, lives on for maybe a minute before it gets scaled down, then maybe it makes sense to have a little bit of persistent store between invocations or between incoming events. Because that way, as I said, you don't want to have to necessarily repopulate your cache or maybe you can do some optimizations and, and you don't want to have to go back to the database every time because maybe that's expensive, right? You can do mm -hmm. some optimizations there, but that's strictly, or that, that's usually just for optimization purposes. It's not going to break your flow <laughs> if you don't do it. Good, good. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Hey, hey Doug, so, so I had a kind of, question about the, the cloud events um, stuff, if you don't mind moving mm -hmm. to the slide. So kind of, I have two kind of security of respective questions. One is related to cloud events. The other one's related to kind of generically um, the programming model. But it seems like, you know, now that you're, you kind of, when I see this, it reminds me a bit of like, you know, OWAP's um, top 10 in the series of things there, right? It seems like, there are certain considerations that also need to kind of have best best practices of with regards to you know the metadata they including over here. Is there uh, is that something that you think needs exploration? Um, for example, over here, is there any restrictions on the source, the ID, are these confidential um, pieces of information and things like that? Do you think it's um, is an area that needs to be explored a little bit more. <laughs> so the, the, the Cloud Events Working Group very purposely avoided anything having to do with security. Um, two reasons. One is it's a very, very uh, uh, complicated topic. Um, there are many different ways to get it done. Uh, there are already existing standards out there that tell you how do you, you can secure messages already, and we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, and nor did we want to necessarily uh, pick a winner, right? So we figured, okay, you can layer on security and signing and encryption and all the other stuff, you know, yourself. Um, and, but the other really, really big reason we decided not to touch it is because we realized that the minute we touched it, we'd never ship a spec. It would, <laughs> we would get bogged <laughs> down in trying to make those, those, answer those questions that, that we would, we would be there for years trying to settle it. Um, and we wanted to avoid some of this, some of the pitfalls that, that some of us ran into in the past with like WS security and stuff like that, right? So we decided at least initially make 1.0 go out with no security whatsoever. People can layer it on themselves later and we can always look at it again later. And in fact, just recently, somebody in our working group proposed a, um, uh, 
uh, an extension mechanism to sign the cloud events, right? And so we are going to be, you know, it, it's a valid it's a valid proposal. So we're going to be looking at it. We may very well adopt it, or we may reject it and say, nope, sorry, we're still not going to touch security. We don't know, but it is definitely something that people will want us to explore. I just don't know where it's going to land. But we decided to go out with 1.0 with with just the bare bone minimum of of how to get the metadata across. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I also, I also think you mentioned that this was going into incubation. What's that? What's that yeah, right? we're already in incubator status. So there's, you know, there's sandbox incubator and then what is, what, what's the final one? Uh, um, graduation. Graduated, thank you. Graduate, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we're, we're in incubator stage and I'll get honest with you, I haven't gone back in a while to check and see what graduated status means um, in terms of what the criteria is. Maybe we should be going for graduated status. I just, I can't remember what the criteria is yet. Uh, but to be honest, the status doesn't mean a whole lot to us. I know that maybe more marketing as store than anything else, uh, but we should probably look at that. But I don't think it changes what we do because we're pretty happy with the current state of things and no one's complained about it or found major bugs yet. So I think we're good. Yeah, I was just wondering because um, that probably means that we, we have to provide some recommendation for, for security as well. So we may have to take a look at this one. How, we may have a bit more work to do. So, <laughs> so what you're saying is if we want to if we want to throw more work on your plate, we just need to go for graduated status. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just farm it over to we just farm it out to Andres. Andres there you go. <laughs> yeah. So so the other question okay. Sorry, sorry, go ahead, friend. Uh, so, so the other thought that I had was like moving towards um, um, serverless. Um, a lot of the traditional security controls can't be done in the way that people are used to. Um, do you see kind of is that being asked for certain, um, you know, exposing certain inner workings of it or creating different abstractions so that people can control? You know where the data is coming from, who is access to the data, whether there's uh, reuse of the same compute nodes for for different functions and things like that. Yeah, just to make sure I understand the question, this is more generic question about serverless and not about cloud events in particular, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think in general, there probably is a desire for some level of interoperability in the serverless runtime itself, whether it's uh, the security aspects that you're talking about or whether it's something as simple as, hey, can we at least standardize on what your function signatures look like, right? There's always gonna be people that want that. Um, and, and we've had lots of conversations about getting into those types of topics, but we, we've kind of shied away from that for the same reason that we landed on cloud events. The minute you do that, it's gonna get very, very political because people have existing things and asking them to change it is gonna be a real nightmare. Um, so I think the best way to answer your question is we may eventually get there, but I think it's gonna take some time. And in particular, I think we need to wait until uh, the serverless working group and the CNCF has had more um, success stories, put it that way, to show that we're not just creating things out of the blue. We are not just trying to take one, one vendor solution or ram it down everybody's throat, but we actually have a success path or success story I'm sorry, success history of producing things that actually are interoperable and provide benefit to the community in a very neutral way. And I think once we've done that with some of the things like cloud events, the subscription API discovery type of stuff, I think once we have those under our belts, then we'll be able to tackle the things that are slightly more political because people will see that we're not in this for any nefarious reason other than to actually help out our customers. So I think the short answer is yes, but not yet. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I, just I have a question on detection. Um, yeah. Are there any standards um, that you're working on in terms of what all should be logged for availability, failure scenarios, and et cetera, et cetera, in terms of data and metadata? I, short answer is no. I haven't heard that topic come up as a possible work item yet. Um, <clears throat> if, if you could actually if you think that's an area of interest, if you can send me a note or something, just give me a little more description in terms of what that area is, I can definitely stick it into the backlog of potential things to look at in the future. I would, you know, we're always looking for new ideas. Sure, because um, both 
both in the build and run phase. And uh, I think there, there are visibility and controls that are needed, uh, especially in uh, regulatory environments. Mm -hmm. um, imagine you're updating stock prices or something using functions. Um, there is auditability requirements that um, financial organizations have to meet. Mm -hmm. So just wondering from that perspective, yes, we can work around and we can build all that as a separate function to capture from other functions, but still it's very complex and um, having a standard in terms of how, what attributes, what data and what um, metadata we need to capture to get a complete visibility of a function, that'd be great. Yeah, that, that might, like I said, if you can send me a note with that information, that'd be really cool because otherwise I'll, I'll forget. Um, just, just, one, just one word of sort of warning about that. <clears throat> um, how do I phrase this right? There may be some nervousness of getting into defining what payloads look like, right? Because I'm sure uh, if you've been around long enough, you, you recognize things like a common event format or something like that, right? Someone says, hey, you know what? I'm going to create the one event to rule them all. And it's going to have all the metadata you could possibly want. And it's all going to be a standardized format. And that's all wonderful. And we've had a gazillion of those. Right, And so the idea of trying to force one particular schema on everybody, even if it's in one domain, is a challenge, right? Let that domain, let, let those domain experts be the ones to do that, right? So if it's, uh, if it's about one particular type of government compliance or regulation kind of thing, let those folks who are experts in that go off and do that if they want. From, the, from our perspective, as of today anyway, we've, we tend to focus more on the, the abstract solutions, you know, just how do you get that specific payload, whether it's standardized or not, from point A to point B, right? So, well, I'm not saying it's not possible for us to one day say, hey, look, this is just a big problem. We need to help the standardization in this one particular area around the schema format. I'm not saying we wouldn't do it for sure. It's just, just a warning. It may be a little, people may be nervous about getting into that. Just a, just a worry. Understood. No yep. worries. Um, I will send you an email. No, thank you. Else. Always. I'm kind of staying on the same topic, I think. It's not so much that we want to impose the semantics, but that we're looking for a mechanism where an existing framework could be leveraged. So when I was trying to understand what you meant by metadata, you know, we're in the security world, so we're thinking about something like the ontology from MITRE attack or uh, some other, you know, variation, a smaller variation of that. So, uh, you know, whether that's a plug-in thing or a traceability thing, which was just alluded to as an audit function, that's kind of what we mean. I don't think you have to pick a winner, but um, the whole, I think, thing that gets me excited about this is that there's a mechanism wherein some abstract amount of, um, of metadata then can be uh, what decomposed to, this, to the level of a function mesh. And that's, that's really the winner, I think. Yeah, so if I understand what you're saying there correctly, um, what, what I think you're describing is more like uh, some sort of hook mechanism, whether it's an inbound or outbound hook thingy, um, on a particular implementation of a serverless framework or whatever framework you're using to host your application. And I can definitely see value in that. The only reason I'm hesitating is because up until now, uh, the serverless working group has, for the most part, been focused on writing specs, not implementations, right? <clears throat> so we obviously have SDKs, but those are SDKs around the specs themselves, and they help to prove the spec out and stuff like that. But so far, the working group has not necessarily said, we are going to go off and create a new project whose sole purpose in life is to write code, right? And that's why I'm a little hesitant to say, yeah, hey, that sounds like something we should get into because we haven't got into that. And we... And, and we'd rather, at least as of now, focus on writing standards around APIs and stuff like that and let multiple implementations go off and adhere to those APIs. But it's definitely is an interesting topic. I, I can understand that perspective. Indeed, we have the same issue with API building, right? So the old API first design, what is that, maybe three years old now? It always begged the question, well, do you stick the metadata in the API or do it some other way? Yeah, yeah, agreed. Great topic, though. Thanks. This is really relevant for us for the community to look at. Yeah, sure. And thanks for all the questions. They're good, good questions.
Any other yeah. questions, comments? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I have one question there. Um, are there any concerns related to open source libraries being used by those uh, like serverless functions? Um, uh, none that have been brought up as part of the working group itself, no. Because as I said, for the most part, we kind of stay out of the implementation of these things. Okay. Um, and it, if there were issues as part of the SDK development, I'm personally not aware of them. I, but I, to be honest, I, I'm not too heavily involved in the SDK side of the house. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I'm not sure if um, or maybe I lost an extended uh, extension of that question to Magnus. Is uh, I think uh, where I look at a security implication is, of course, it's still code. You have a lot of open source packages that you're building on top of, and uh, and obviously there is a need to have visibility into the vulnerability posture and then those go back into compliance kind of regulations and having visibility to make sure those are being addressed as well. I mean, I think that the threat dimension is extended across all of those application stacks, right? Whether it's VMs, containers, and serverless. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, anyway, so it's just a comment there. Uh, any other questions uh, from the group for Doug? Great. Uh, well, Doug, thank you so much. This was a, a fabulous uh, presentation. I think uh, you know it really clarified some of the nuances for us as we think about. Uh, I know that, uh, and just for the broader team, uh, you know, Aradna is leading an effort to talk about you know the security in the context of serverless. So this is incredibly helpful, and uh, hopefully we can lean on you for your uh, expertise as we progress through uh, that project as well. Sure. And thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, see you all next week. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank Cheers. you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Be well.